Hello, hello! My name is Colin. You are watching Americans Learn. Today I'm going to be watching Napoleon's masterpiece, uh, Austerlitz. Uh, Aust Austerlitz. 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 1805. Um, sorry for the brutalization of that pronunciation. Aust Austerlitz. I'm going to keep doing it. Austerlitz. I'm sure I'll hear it in the, the video and um, learn just how incorrect I was. Um, but yes, this is another video by Epic History TV. Uh, last time I watched uh, Napoleon's first victory. This is the video that was posted directly after that one. Um, but uh, yeah, I didn't have a lot to comment on on that last video, but just because it's, it's a lot of like information. Um, but uh, it's... Yeah, certainly very interesting. I know Napoleon was an interesting historical figure. Um, maybe not. Yeah, he's a contentious historical figure, I guess, is, is as much as I know so far. Um, but certainly a, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, certainly proficient in the art of war, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, so... I guess without further ado, why don't we just uh, get into it, right? All right. An Epic History TV History March collaboration, supported by our sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. In December 1804, in the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris, Napoleon Bonaparte crowned himself Emperor of the French. Europe had never seen such a sudden and dramatic rise to power. A son of impoverished Corsican nobility to military dictator of France in little more than 10 years. Revolution and war had cleared Napoleon's path to the throne. War would dominate his 10-year reign. A conflict unprecedented in history that would leave millions dead and a continent in turmoil. Eight months after Napoleon's coronation, the French Empire and its Spanish ally were at war with Britain, and Napoleon had assembled an army of 180,000 men along the Channel coast. But as long as the British Royal Navy ruled the seas, invasion was impossible. But nor could Britain challenge France on land. And so British Prime Minister William Pitt tried to build a European coalition against Napoleon, using diplomacy and gold. Britain would prove Napoleon's most steadfast enemy, and its press delighted... Right, okay. I'm guessing that, yeah, it's... Tally... Talleyrand's plan for invading Great Britain. Yeah, man, political cartoons, really... Some things never change about those political cartoons, right? Oh, boy. ...in relentless mockery of the French Emperor. Britain and France were old rivals <laughs> in Europe and overseas. But now, Pitt feared Napoleon's conquests had made France too powerful. The French Emperor had to be defeated and Europe's balance of power restored if there was ever to be lasting peace. Pitt found willing allies in Europe, among monarchs who despised Napoleon as a product of the French Revolution and a dangerous threat to the existing order. Austria harbored the deepest grievances, having seen her influence in Germany and Italy steadily eroded by French victories. The final straw came in May 1804, when Napoleon had also crowned himself King of Italy in Milan. Austria, Russia, Sweden and Naples joined Britain in an alliance known as the Third Coalition. Okay, so if I'm looking at this map correctly, and my history of this region of, of Europe is during this period is not not great but I guess it looks like Italy was not one whole country during this time so like Kingdom of Italy is right in the northern area 
and then Naples is a whole kingdom of Naples. It's like a separate country. It looks like we've got Etruria and Papal States. Papal States, I'm assuming because of Rome and the Vatican and all that stuff. Etruria. I don't think I've ever heard of that before. Interesting. And devised an ambitious plan for a series of joint offensives against France. The main attack would be made by a combined Austro-Russian army, advancing across the Rhine into France. But Napoleon got word of their plans, and reacted with typical speed and decision. He was determined to strike first, before the Allies could join forces, and ordered his army, now renamed La Grande Armée, to march to the River Rhine. His target was the Austrian army of General Mack, which had made a premature advance against Bavaria, a French ally, and was now dangerously isolated from the other Allied armies. Napoleon ordered Marshal Murat, his famously flamboyant cavalry commander, to make faint attacks through the Black Forest, while the rest of his army, advancing at speed, enveloped Mack's army from the north. That summer, Napoleon's Grande Armée was at its most formidable. Well-trained, highly motivated, its regiments at full strength. What's more, it had been newly reorganised according to the Corps system, later imitated by virtually every army in the world. Each corps, commanded by a marshal, was a mini-army of 15 to 30,000 soldiers, with its own infantry, cavalry, artillery and supporting arms, such as reconnaissance, engineers and transport. This meant each corps could march and fight for a limited time independently allowing Napoleon to break with the old doctrine of keeping his army concentrated, and advance with his corps widely dispersed. This helped to disguise his real objective, and increased movement speed, because the army could advance along multiple roads and live off the land, taking its supplies from scattered villages, rather than relying on slow-moving supply wagons. When the enemy's main force was located, the army could quickly concentrate for battle. This is how Napoleon's army was able to move at a speed that often surprised and disorientated his enemies. Okay, so this is being presented, at least to me, as like the way that he structured his uh, army uh, amongst the different corps, corps, right? You don't pronounce the P, right? Corps. Um and advancing and all that stuff and basically each one of those groups acting as its own individual army to spread out and then reconvene at the location that where they want to take was all of this uh manifested through the mind of napoleon by himself or were there did they have advisors that also threw these out like where does the credit go is it all going to napoleon or were there other people involved in uh this new way of uh, strategizing your troops. Let me know in the comments, or maybe the, the video will explain that. But so far, it seems like all the credit is going to Napoleon, so... I don't know. Interesting. Mac didn't realize the danger he was in until it was too late. Napoleon's fast-moving corps crossed the Danube corps. behind him, and surrounded his army. Mack launched a series of poorly coordinated counter-attacks, but despite... I'm sorry, but just... I don't know how well... You probably can't see too well in, in the small frame picture, but if, you, if you're watching this video on full screen on your computer or whatever... Uh, these two guys in the middle, or even three, these three guys like in the middle of the frame here, their eyes are just bulging. <laughs> kind of, and the mustaches too. I, sorry, I, I can't help but giggle at that. <laughs> Some desperate fighting, the Austrians couldn't break out of the trap. 
Mack hoped that Kutuzov's Russian army could arrive in time to save him, but the Russians were still 160 miles away. And so, at Ulm, on the 19th of October, just six weeks into the war, Mack surrendered his army to Napoleon. The French took nearly 60,000 Austrian prisoners, mm. and Napoleon had struck his first devastating blow against the coalition. Russian General Mikhail Kutuzov was an experienced and wary commander, more cautious than Mack. His army was exhausted after its 900-mile march from Russia, but hearing of the Austrians' surrender at Ulm, and knowing he wasn't strong enough to face Napoleon alone, he immediately ordered a retreat. Napoleon pursued. The Russians fought several sharp rearguard actions, but could not save the Austrian capital, Vienna, which the French occupied on the 12th of October. Kutuzov slipped away to Olmutz in today's Czech Republic, where he was joined by reinforcements, as well as Emperor Alexander of Russia and Emperor Francis of Austria in person. Napoleon was furious that Kutuzov had escaped. By now his army was also exhausted, and far from home, with winter approaching. He needed to force a decisive battle quickly. Fortunately for him, the overconfident 27-year-old Russian Emperor sought the glory of battle, overriding the concerns of his veteran commander, General Kutuzov. With the Allied army closing in, Napoleon ordered his corps to rapidly concentrate on a battlefield he had carefully selected, near the town of Austerlitz. Honestly, too, just like the, trying to think about how they would coordinate between the different uh, corps uh, during this time period without, you know, uh, even, what do you call it? Uh, Morse code. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Like, no rapid form of communication, even Morse code. Uh, maybe they used pigeons or something, but to be able to communicate what the strategy is amongst these distances between the different cores, like that's, it's beyond me. I, I have no idea how they made that work during, that, during this time. Napoleon oversaw the dispositions of his army late into the night, then grabbed a few hours sleep beside a campfire. Dawn would mark the first anniversary of his coronation as emperor and promised a battle that would make or break his young empire. The morning of the 2nd of December 1805 was cold and bright with a heavy mist. Two armies of near equal size faced each other across a seven-mile-wide battlefield. But the Allies held the high ground of the Pratzen Heights, while French Third Corps under Marshal Davout was still marching to the battlefield. Seeing Napoleon's thinly stretched right flank, the Allies planned a large-scale attack from the Pratzen Heights to steamroller the French right, before swinging round to envelop Napoleon's army. Little did they know, Napoleon was counting on his weak right wing luring the Allies into just such a move, whereupon he would launch his own attack on the Pratzen Heights to cut the Allied army in half. Hmm. His bold plan relied on his correct prediction of Allied movements, the speedy arrival of Davout's Third Corps on his right, and a perfectly timed counterattack. The battle began around 7 a.m. Now, I wonder uh, if the people that were in that weak group of Napoleon's uh, army, if they knew that they were going to be like pawns, essentially, you know, sacrifice. Oh, man. Did they share that kind of info with, with the, the, the lower end, the troops themselves? 
Oh, that's rough. Right. As Austrian troops of General Keinmayer's advance guard clashed with French troops defending the village of Telnitz. In the face of overwhelming odds, the French fought stubbornly and bravely. But gradually, they were forced back. But the Allies, instead of carrying out their great enveloping attack, did nothing. The morning mist and the late arrival of orders had led to confusion and delay, and it was another hour before the first three Allied columns were on the move. Soon fierce fighting erupted around Sokolnitz village and castle. Marshal Davout's corps, which had just force-marched 70 miles in two days, now arrived to strengthen the French right wing. Around 9am, his lead infantry brigade appeared suddenly through the mist and retook Telnitz, before being driven back in turn by Austrian hussars. Two more of Davout's brigades reinforced French troops at Sokolnitz. As the mist began to clear, Napoleon saw that, as he'd hoped, the Allied left was moving off the Pratzen Heights and he ordered Marshal Soult's 4th Corps to begin its attack. To the alarm of Allied commanders, two French infantry divisions, until now hidden by the mist, were suddenly seen advancing straight towards the Allied centre. General Kutuzov was forced to hurriedly organise a defence of the heights, using troops of four columns. Two hours of bloody fighting followed. Musket fire was so rapid and furious that both sides were soon low on ammunition and turned to the bayonet. By 11am, the French, with the advantage in training and discipline, had secured the heights and driven a deep wedge into the Allied position. To the north, a giant cavalry battle developed. While a Russian force from General Bagration's advance guard captured the village of Bosenitz before it was halted by cannon fire from the Santon Hill. A decisive charge by six regiments of French heavy cavalry finally drove back the Allies, allowing Marshal Land's V Corps to move forward and seize Blasowitz and Krug. Now, Grand Duke Constantine, commanding the Russian Imperial Guard, led forward this last Allied reserve in a desperate bid to reclaim the Pratzen Heights. A battalion of the French 4th Line Regiment was charged down by Russian Guard cavalry, losing its eagle standard in bloody fighting. Napoleon, who'd moved up to the heights, sent in his own guard cavalry. In this grim melee between the elite horsemen of both armies, the French finally prevailed. Napoleon had broken the Allied centre. Now, to close the trap on the Allied left wing, still locked in heavy fighting around Sokolnitz. Around 2 p.m., Napoleon ordered four divisions to swing south and cut off their retreat. General Buxhauden, commanding the Allied left, only now saw the danger he was in. Attacked from three sides, the only escape was south. Many of his troops were forced to flee across frozen ponds. <laughs> French artillery opened fire trying to smash the ice with their cannonballs. About 200 men and dozens of horses drowned in the freezing water. But not the many thousands of Napoleon's propaganda. The French Emperor had won a brilliant victory. His army had taken more than 10,000 prisoners and captured 45 enemy standards. Thousands of dead and wounded of all sides littered the battlefield, 
many left untended for hmm. days. The Battle of the Three Emperors, as it became known, was a crushing blow to the Third Coalition. As Russian forces retreated back to Russia, Francis I of Austria was forced to accept a humiliating settlement with France, agreeing to pay a 40 million franc indemnity and give up more territory in exchange for peace. But meanwhile, news had reached Napoleon of a disastrous Franco-Spanish defeat at sea off Cape Trafalgar. British Admiral Lord Nelson, at the cost of his own life, had masterminded a victory so complete that it ensured British naval dominance, not just for the rest of the war, but for the next 100 years. Britain, master of the sea, Napoleon, unbeatable on land. The whale and the elephant, neither able to challenge the other in its own domain. When William Pitt received news of Napoleon's victory at Austerlitz, he's supposed to have said, roll up that map of Europe, it will not be wanted these ten years. A month later, Pitt was dead. But his warning that Europe faced another ten years of war and upheaval was to prove prophetic. Napoleon Bonaparte was the ultimate disruptor of European history. One man who transformed a continent. If you want to find out more, why not try a free trial with The Great Courses Plus, a fantastic on-demand video subscription service featuring more than 70 history courses, all taught by top academics. Their course, Living the French Revolution and the Age of Napoleon, provides superb context, with 48 half-hour lectures that you can watch on your TV, laptop or phone, wherever you are, at a time to suit you. If you love history, you'll be tempted by dozens of their courses, The Big History of Civilizations and American Military History taught by General Wesley Clark, are just two that caught our eye. And they don't just do history. In all, there's more than 10,000 lectures covering every topic from science, maths and philosophy, to cookery and personal development. Visit thegreatcoursesplus.com slash epichistorytv or click on the link in the video description below to start your free trial today. Thanks to fellow YouTube channel History March for creating the battle map and animations. And of course to all our Patreon supporters for making this video possible. Visit the Epic History TV Patreon page to find out how you can support the channel, get early access to videos, and vote on future topics. All right, I think that's it. I'm not really sure how much of, of that I'm supposed to be sharing. You know, they, they put through in all that work. Might as well show it, right? Um, well, there you go. Another interesting history video uh, regarding Napoleon and those battles. That um, Again, I'm, I'm trying to f figure out this, um, what the proper way to respond or react to these videos is. Like, I don't want to be <laughs> too disrespectful. I mean, I did pause the video and point out how goofy those eyes were in that one painting, but... Given the, the subject material, it feels off, especially after coming off the back of a few other uh, uh, goofier <laughs> videos to react to. Um, but yeah, this is like really interesting uh, history to learn about. Obviously, something I I don't know a ton about. I still don't. O Austerlitz, Austerlitz. For some reason, my mind wants to say like Osterschlitz. I'm, I'm, my brain tends to want to make things more difficult than they need to be. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, God, to live through this period of time in Europe would be chaos. Um, I mean, just imagine living in a period uh, where the countries are constantly, like the borders are changing always, like through violent means like this, just... Ooh, I guess the last time that r really happened was World War II, right? Oh, let me know if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, 
yeah, geez, what a brutal time period. Um, but yeah, so uh, if you enjoyed this, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. I don't remember if I mentioned that at the beginning, but here we are at the end telling you to like, share, and subscribe. Uh, if you, especially if you liked uh, this content and want to see more, you got to like it. Um, and if you subscribe, subscribe, you'll probably get notified. You can ring the bell button, I guess, to do that. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I'll see you guys next time. All right. Without further ado, here are the patrons.